How many of you old enough to remember the Kit Kat commercial? Give me a break. Give me a break. Break me up. <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I did not have that thought when I wrote the title of this message. And I thought about just buying a bunch of Kit Kats and just throwing them out just to help you remember. But then I knew you'd have so much energy you couldn't pay attention, so I, I obfuscated on that idea. Some of your boos are louder than your amens. That'll preach. Can we really have it all? That's a great question to start off. Can we really have it all? Maybe the answer to that question depends on what you mean when you say it all, right? So if the question is rephrased, can I have everything that God has to offer me and everything that the world has to offer me? The answer is no. The Bible makes that very, very clear. And so those of you that are now in James chapter 4, verse 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Guys, that's heavier than what we give it credit for. We're working so hard to be liked, wanted, desired by people of and the systems of the world that we don't understand that to necessarily do that is to necessarily make an enemy out of God. Now, if I, if I go back to our, our teaching on deliverance and I brought out the little door that has the, the door that goes in two doorways, to open the door to the enemy is to necessarily close the door on Jesus. But to open the door to Jesus is to necessarily close the door on the enemy. We don't seem to understand that concept unless we think we're just trying to stay free so we don't come out worse than what we were before. But if it's a daily choice or decision, we don't understand that choosing to do something that's wrong slams the door on Jesus' influence in our life and his access to us. We make an enemy of God when we choose to do what he said not to do. That's not taught in a lot of places. That's why there's going to be a lot of shock and awe when they stand before God and they hear, depart from me, I never knew you, because we've been taught, well, you can straddle the fence. You can do both. You can have your spiritual life and you can have your worldly life. Everything that I have, have access to or control over, needs to be completely submitted to God. And we say that, yes, that may, yeah, of course that makes sense. That means he needs to control where your car goes, what comes out of your account, where it goes. We don't have checkbook registers a whole lot anymore, but maybe we could do a digital printout and let's find out where the money's going. Where your heart is, the Bible says your treasure will be there too. It's alarming to me when I'm on the way to church about the time everybody else is having church and I see parking lots that I see more asphalt than I do vehicles. That breaks my heart. When I go to a Thunder game, Nicholas and I got to park several blocks away because there is no close spot. And even when we're parking several blocks away, we still got to pay money to park. You, you see what I'm saying? And yet, the greatest place in the world it's where you get to hang out with God and God's people, get loved on by him, healed, set free, delivered, restored, mended. That's the greatest place you can, act, you can actually go. We pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to hospitals and doctors to come out the same or worse than what we went in. In fact, the prescription today is to counteract the symptoms from the prescription they gave you the last time that you came. Y'all ain't hearing anything yet. We cannot be friends with what Jesus died to save us from and still claim intimate relationship with him. See, there's a lot of things in life that are mutually exclusive, okay? I cannot be monogamous 
and a polygamist simultaneously. Can't do it. I cannot be in Russia and America at the same time. I, I cannot be a Muslim and a Christian at the same time. And I'm going to say this too. It's going to hair lip some of you, and that's okay. See me after class. You cannot be a Mason and a Jesus lover at the same time. I'm not talking about a bricklayer. Okay? I, I, I'm saying this not to hurt your feelings, but to tell you now so you can get hair lipped at me and still make it to glory instead of loving me and getting hair lipped when you get to glory. Y'all ain't hearing anything yet. You, you, listen, it's, it's a trap. Not everybody that references a higher power means Jesus. And I really hair-lipped somebody one time when they told me, yeah, I've got the Holy Spirit, and I do sweat lodges all the time. And I looked at them, and I said, you don't need peyote to get in the Spirit if you have the Holy Spirit. Never saw them again. But I'm going to tell you, every time they go to take that, they got to remember what I said. Y'all ain't hearing anything yet. Y'all think this, y'all think this Jesus servant stuff is a bunch of kumbaya. Do you, you understand? You will never make a difference if you don't change direction, and you'll never change direction if you stay in the car. You catch that? I remember going to some... Uh, some funerals on motorcycles, biker funerals. And if you're at the front of the pack and traffic is not stopping, sometimes you got to police your own traffic. That means you pull up into a busy intersection, put your hazards on, tell everybody to stop, and pray to God they don't hit you. Y'all ain't hearing anything yet. you you got to put yourself in harm's way to stop traffic. To redirect traffic, to change people's course, you have to put yourself in the middle and say, hey, stop. Nobody wants to get in traffic. They want to meet me, meet me. And then, like, they're going to understand what you're saying. Everyone's done nothing. You've got to put yourself in that position and say, hey, and that's why sometimes, you ever, you ever broke up a dog fight? I don't know of anybody yet that's broke up a dog fight that didn't come out worse for where? Because you get in the middle of a fight, you're going to get brought into the fight. You catch what I'm saying? And it's the same way with the enemy. When he's fighting people's lives and you're trying to walk in as a protector and pull them apart, many times you're going you're to be a little bit worse for where? But if we don't put ourselves in a position to stop stuff, then stuff won't stop. You want to know what ministry is? It's not pontificating on a microphone. It's putting yourself in the big middle. Hey! I got to get off the first page. A Google quote search revealed that in 2004, a CNN poll came out that said 59% of all Americans answered by saying they wish they could slow down and cope better with the busyness of life. 59% in 2004. This is 2024. So a more recent search indicated the following. 60% of respondents in the UK, it's not the USA, 60% of respondents in the UK believed that their life is busier now than it was in the 1980s. The American perspective says 61% of working Americans reported not having enough time to do the things that they wanted to do, suggesting a widespread sense of busyness. 
eight out of ten people describe themselves as busy. This is just a snapshot into people's perspective. Uh, perspectives and lives busyness has become an epidemic busyness is big business i was just talking to somebody uh just this morning i'm turning this down for me y'all can cover up i can't strip (laughs) busyness has become an epidemic that I believe has meant to destroy us mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and materially. Christians are suffering from it every bit as much as non-Christians. So I want to deal with the what, why, and how. What, why, and how have we allowed busyness to overtake us and then what are we going to do about it so first what's happening to us as a result of all this busyness and stress well we start off a morning by going to the coffee pot and we stimulate our bodies artificially with an infusion of caffeine in order to generate enough awareness to get on with our day and then we wind up taking pills and elixirs at night in order to stop the artificial inflation of energy so that we can find ourselves in a, in a more relaxed state to try to get some sleep. And in most instances, what we're getting is sleep and not rest. Sleep can be artificial. Rest comes from God. So in his book, Margin, Dr. Richard Swenson lists 13 physical symptoms of excess stress. 13 physical symptoms of excess stress. Here they are. If you're taking notes, write fast. Now, what are these? These are not culprits. These are symptoms that there's stress in your life. Okay? Number one, a stimulation of the cardiovascular system, which shows up as rapid pulse, palpitations, increased blood pressure, chest pains, and arrhythmias. Number two, Gastrointestinal overactivity, hyperacidity, ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome, diarrhea. You don't never know what you're going to hear when you come to excuses. Number three, tightening of the muscles, especially of the head, neck, or lower back. Number four, headaches. Five, weight changes. And this happens when you use food as a tranquilizer. Number six, increase in infections and cancer, which is a compromised immune system. Number seven, rashes and itching. (laughs) I'm always curious how many people are going to start going. As soon as the, it's just like mentioning lice. Exactly, everybody starts scrubbing it. Okay, so number eight, insomnia. Number nine, here's a big one, unexplained fatigue. 10, shortness of breath. 11, perspiration or cold, clammy hands. 12, nervous tics and tremors. 13, teeth and jaw clenching. How many of you have three or more of those symptoms? How many have five or more of those symptoms? Seven or more. Ten or more. Dr. Kramer, we're going to see you right after church. (laughs) Some of us have discovered this wonderful thing that God made called adrenaline. You know, you're driving home late at night. The music is just right. The temperature is just perfect. And you find yourself. Huh? Huh? Until you hear this 18-wheeler, ah, ah, and for about the next five minutes, you're okay. Why? That adrenaline, right? That is, that is a God-given mechanism to use on the short term. Jesus, help me right now. To use on the short term to help us out of a jam. 
just like sugar. Sugar can be used in small dosages to give us a little boost. But if you make your diet mostly sugar, now you're absolutely messing with the system that God made you. I remember as a kid, I'm old enough back in the day, all they had for coffee was milk, powdered cream, and little, little cubes of sugar. How many remember that? You go to church, it had a bowl, and it was, you know, it, God forbid if it ever got wet, it's kind of, anyway. So those little cubes of sugar. And as a kid, I'd go grab me some of them cubes. Woo! Yeah! Huh? Love that sugar. Listen, when I was in high school, my best friend in high school, he, he, he traded in a 1986 IROC Z. This is in 1989. A 1986 IROC Z black T tops velour interior ran like a scalded dog. Okay, great car, and I was so excited for him to pull in. You know that next week, and because uh, we were going to go to lunch because we had lunch out in those days. Like, Woo! Getting that IROC baby. I still love IROCs today. Yep. And next thing I know, he pulled in this old 1969 Pontiac GTO. I thought, 86 to 69. What are you doing, man? He said, yeah, I didn't like that IROC. So I traded it in on this. Let me get this straight. You traded in an 86. In 1989, you traded in an 86 for a 1969? He said, who said that? Yeah. He said, you haven't been in this car yet. So I walked over to the car, beautiful, shaved door handles weren't there, the little button up by the windshield wiper, you hit the button and the door ejects, you know what I'm saying, just space age kind of stuff. It was ground up restoration, okay, ground up. It was nothing that hadn't been fixed, repaired, modified, whatever. So he said, let's, let's go for a ride. So we went for a ride. <sighs> and so... It's amazing how many people run up next to you when you're in a goat. Everybody, okay? Mustangs, Corvettes, you, don't matter. If they see you and they saw us, you know, here they come. So what we did is it was a gas station not far from where we were at that sold jet fuel. So he had done the math and calculations and you put an X amount of gas and then you put in X amount of jet fuel. So then we get on the interstate, and he said, now watch this. And when he hit that gas, you'd have thought the back wheels were on fire. <laughs> I thought, oh, my goodness. I got my life right with Jesus. <laughs> Here's the issue. Did we enjoy the jet fuel? Yes. Did it cost us very much to get it? No. Was the car designed for jet fuel? So we got away with it for a long time. Until one day, the motor decided, I don't like you putting all that adrenaline. Oh, did I say adrenaline? I'm sorry. That jet fuel in the system. Do you understand this is why many police officers, before they retire or, or shortly thereafter, wind up having heart issues? You want to know why? Because most of their life on the workforce is going from one calamity and problem to another one. Put on the siren. Woo, 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 adrenaline. And so they will tell you, they see places in the heart that have been adversely affected from adrenaline rush, constant adrenaline, so that it winds up damaging the heart. Now watch, the same adrenaline that God gave us, get this, that God gave us to help us. I've heard of stories where some little kid, you know, the uh, single mom out on the side of the road changing a, a tire, the jack fell, the little kid was underneath it being pinched by the car, and little old mama reached up there and grabbed that 1970, whatever it was, and picked that car up to get that. That's adrenaline. That's adrenaline. But we're not designed to run on adrenaline. We're supposed to use it like nitrous oxide every once in a while, Psst but not all the time. And this is what's happening now in church. We show up for sugar rush. I need to feel good. I need to stay awake. I need to get through the day. I got to finish all this stuff. 
I got to get up Monday and do it all over again. You better, you better give me something. You, you catch what I'm saying? And, and we're missing the fact that we're trying to artificially stimulate what God built to run flawless. And we're doing that spiritually. We wind up living vicariously off of other people's walk and relationship with God instead of having our own. Because we'd whole lot rather use their fumes than our energy. I'm so, this is no excuses, right? <laughs> Stress overload doesn't just affect us physically. It affects us emotionally. Some people fall into different kinds of addictions. Not because they're bad people, because of a bad lifestyle. So when we're not managing stress effectively, we might become controlling of other people. Isn't that funny? If I don't handle my stress, then the stress in my life doesn't want to stay within the borders of my life. It wants to reach beyond my borders to affect those that are around me. And how does it affect those that are around me? Through control and manipulation. Even intimidation. Because fear, whether it's in here or out there, has the same impact. How many ever heard birds of a feather? Yeah. And misery loves. And so we've learned that because people, have you noticed that people that are fearful about stuff immediately gravitate to other people that have fears? Have you noticed that? Pay attention. Confident people are drawn to confident people. People with poor self-image are drawn to people with poor self-image. We attract what we are. That hacks some people off. But it's, it's just a fact. So, one of the biggest cries that I hear from people today is they want healthy relationships. In fact, a large majority of the counseling that I do has to do with bad relationships. Sometimes people are just lonely. Sometimes they're embarrassed of their history, cause them to back away from other people. Or sometimes, just like jet fuel or carbureted system, they become overheated and their system gets damaged and the fabric of who they are and how they relate to other people becomes fragile. God wants us to have healthy relationships. He built other people for relationships. But healthy relationships happen to emotionally healthy people. I'm going to say that again. Healthy relationships happen to emotionally healthy people. Sometimes people get irritated with me. They, they come in as a couple or whatnot, and I just, you, you just need to tell her. And, no, you just need to tell him, and it, it winds up being this finger pointing. You know what I'm saying? And so when they find out that I'm not here, I don't even care what you got to say about the other person. Why don't you tell me what's going on with you? Why are you acting the way you do? Why are you explosive? Why are you, why are you irritable? Why are you growling at me? Talk to me about you. Well, it's because she, she ain't living in you. You sitting over there, she's sitting over here. What's up with you? Because emotionally healthy people will produce healthy relationships. But if I'm unhealthy, I will contribute to an un. So it's not a matter, everybody wants to come in for counseling and point the other, they did, blah, blah. here's what I'd like to have, I'd, I'd like to have a new rule. When you come to me for any kind of marriage relationship stuff, I want you to have a list of, 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 of culprits that you own. What have you done to cause the breakdown? I don't care what they did, they're going to say what they did, they're going to rat themselves out, you tell me what you did. Oh, we don't want that. We want to go where somebody's going to get on our side and get on the other side and tell them how they, I know who I'm talking to. Y'all looking all holy right now. We 
We really do need relationships with other people in order to be healthy. You're not going to be healthy on your own. You know, in business, in business, you have to have healthy profit margins. How many of you are self-employed? Hold it high, self-employed. You got to, especially when you're self-employed, you got to have healthy profit margins. Now, listen, if you're working for a, another company or whatnot, that's fine, but you got to add up all your bills, and your income needs to exceed those bills by as much as possible. That's a, that's, that's a healthy margin, right? What happens when... Our income's margin is lower than the outgo. Okay? It's not going to work. And so when, when you have a, a healthier margin where you have, you have profit over expense, now you can afford to rest, eat well, have relationships on a social level. There's a lot of things that you can, you can do the math yourself, right? So what happens is the enemy wants to shrink those margins so that we don't have enough of anything to give to God. And when he can't get the margins to shrink... He'll use us to shrink them by causing us to be unhealthy, irritable, angry, resentful, spiteful. These are just symptoms. If you get in a car and you, 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 you named it Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, because that's how it runs. <laughs> Somebody else who gets in that car is going to know it. Something's not right here. Some's broke, right? Plugs, wires, coil, timing, something's off. You got to fix this. And we got people living their lives. If we, if we walked in demonstrating as an automobile what our life is like, some of us would walk in like this. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. <laughs> Can you imagine sitting there shaking like a Model T trying to tell them, I'm fine. Ain't nothing wrong with me. How are you doing? Yet in the spirit, you can see that happening. So you see it all cool on the outside, but you're looking in their eyes and you recognize there's something misfiring in there. You can a lot of times tell, too, all it takes is that one phone call. Oh, let me get this real quick. What? No! No! They can't! No, not right now! They lose it. Why? Because they were already on the brink. You just didn't know it. They were already there. Stress will do this. We need a break today. And I don't mean a Kit Kat. Listen to this statement. If you're taking notes, write this down. Extremely busy people eventually will find themselves in a spiritual drought. One more time. Extremely busy people will eventually find themselves in a spiritual drought. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I tell you, stop being worried or anxious. Does that sound familiar? Remember Thursday? We make a decision, I will not fear. God will never give you instructions to do something that's, that's outside of your ability to do. So if he tells you to stop being anxious, that means you have the ability to do it. How many of you are of the generation that when you started crying because you knew you were going to get in trouble? Mom or dad looked at you and said, you stop crying or I'm going to give you something to cry about. How many grew up in that generation? Woo! Huh? We automatically start giving the symptoms. We ain't been hit. We didn't get whooped. We ain't been grounded. They didn't take our plate of food away. Nothing's happened. We're just in the room. Quit it. Because it's within our control to do that. And God is saying that about us now. Stop worrying. Why? Because worry causes stress. So God's saying, stop doing what's giving the enemy access. Back to verse 25. Stop being worried or anxious, which is perpetually uneasy or distracted about your life as to what you will eat, 
what you'll drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow seed or reap the harvest or gather the crops into barns, and yet your heavenly Father keeps feeding them. Are you not worth much more than they are? Verse 27. And who of you by worrying can add one hour to the length of his life? And why are you worried about clothes? Look at the lilies of the, wild, or the, lilies of the field and the wildflowers of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin wool to make clothing. And yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory and splendor dressed himself like one of these. Verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive and green today and tomorrow is cut and thrown as fuel into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Verse 31. Therefore, do not be worried or anxious, saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? For the pagan Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, but they do not worry. For your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Look at verse 33, and this is it. But first, so we've already discussed all the stuff that we need. Don't worry about all this stuff. So he's saying instead of worrying about all that stuff, instead, first and most importantly, seek, aim at, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, the attitude and the character of God, and all these other things will be given to you. What other things? What you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where are you going to get the money? All that stuff will be added to you when you do what? When you seek after God first instead of as an afterthought because what you did to provide it didn't work. So what happens when we get too busy? We put God on the back burner and everybody else on the front burner instead of putting God on the front burner and everybody else on the back burner. Why? Why? Honestly, because we see them as our paycheck instead of God. We tend to fight the fires of urgency. And then avoid what's eternal. That's like having, having work be so busy that all of your diet is fast food. You're pulling through Church's Chicken, Taco Smell, Whataburger, Burger Queen. I mean, you name it. It's, it's all this fast food stuff. Why? Because you're just trying to throw enough fuel on the fire to keep it burning to get you through the night or to the night. But over time, it's just like adrenaline. Your body will use it in a pinch but that's not what it's designed to consume. How many's ever heard you are what you eat? Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Verse 4. I have seen that every effort and labor and every skill in work comes from man's rivalry with his neighbor. This too is vanity futility, false pride, and chasing after the wind. The fool folds his hands together and consumes his own flesh, destroying himself by idleness and apathy. One hand full of rest and patience is better than two fists full of labor and chasing after the wind. So why is all this happening? How did we get here? How do we get so stress-filled in our lives? I think one of the first things we've got to look at is sociological. It's our relationships with other people. You know, electricity is a, is a concoction of the last hundred years or so. I mean, think about it. We don't even understand how much we depend on electricity until a, until a storm Try to make toast, can't do it. Flip on a light, can't do it. Check the news, can't do it. Charge your phone, can't do it. 
It's like, what did people do before electricity? Well, most of, of mankind's existence was before electricity. So they, they had to do something. Listen, they're, they're, instead of, watch this, instead of making artificial light at night to stay up when we should be sleeping, God set a light in the sky to let us know when to be awake and a nightlight at night to let us know when to be asleep. Y'all ain't hearing anything. So electricity is being used to fight God's creation so that we wind up being awake, which is killing us because God set a time clock on the inside of us to fix ourselves internally, and when we stay up past that, it depletes. Y'all ain't hearing anything. So we're using, watch, inventions to make our lives better. Life is better. Is it? You know, God, he did not create us to be comfortable. I've been looking a lot about diets here lately. And I don't mean just for the sake of shedding weight. I mean just what we consume, diets, right? And you know, those that are of the holistic line will tell you, we were never designed by God to eat three to five times a day. You better hear this. We're not created for that. We were created to eat when there's food and then go back hunting and foraging and doing it. So you're, you're probably going to eat about once a day. And, and what happens is you digest that meal and now your innards can relax. Because if you're constantly forcing food in there, that means that it's constantly having to digest. If it's constantly having to digest, it's got to put stuff places in. I don't know what to do with that. Put it over here. And we go, Huh? Because it doesn't know what to do with the cost. Because there's more going in than the effort that's coming out. Y'all don't hear anything I'm saying. Or you are, you're just not liking it. You, you catch what I'm saying? So we were meant to consume, get some energy, and then go do the work. We complain, I just, I just need air conditioning, glory. I just, I, just need, I just need the cold air. That's why God created Sweat. It gets the toxins out, and then he uses the wet toxins to cause the wind to come across to make our skin feel cool. To Why do you think that air conditioning is humid? It's wet. What did God create us to do in order to get cool? Sweat, which is to get wet. See, we keep trying to improve on what God did when what God did didn't need improvements, it needed to be abided by. So then let's look at some other technological things. Malls. That's not even so much a thing today as it used to be. I still like going to Penn Square and, and other places and people watch. Some of y'all like to watch birds. I like to watch people. Okay? You learn a lot from watching people. I don't know how much you can learn from watching birds. I don't know. Um... Do you know that the amount of leisure time enjoyed by the average American has decreased 37% since 1973? It's no wonder we're tired. The income per capita peaked in the early 70s. And ever since then, the per capita has gone down. You say, well, how are we, how are we able to have so much more? Because now we got two income homes. And the invention of this thing called credit. Huh? So now technology progress has increased our pace of life. How many of you are old enough to remember the, the little race car sets that either did a circle or a, or a figure eight, and you had the little controllers? And if you, if you had the really the top of the line stuff, you could hit a button and it switched lanes and it kicked them off the track? Huh? Have you ever tried to have you ever tried to make it do more than what it was designed to do? Now, I've only found one person who's made one of those power wheels. When my kids were young, we had a little Escalade power wheel. You know, they had uh, enough room for two kids to get in. You hit the gas. Huh? And I thought, man, that is, that is too slow. So I got me an 18-volt battery and modified. Huh? And so then... I put them in there, and, and I loved that because it didn't take as long to charge those 18 volts as it did the original battery that came with it. 
Then Nicholas Potts tells me, well, I took two 20-volt batteries, and I stuck them suckers together and wired that thing up. And, <laughs> huh? So somebody's always trying to push it past, watch, what it was designed to do. I didn't care if the car blew up because we didn't give a whole lot for it in the first place. So let's just see what it'll do. But that's not the way we are with our bodies. We can't keep pressing and pushing our bodies to the extremes and then just say, well, I'm just going to see what it's going to do because at some point it's going gonna, it's gonna to be over. You catch what I'm saying? You say, how in the world is this spiritual? I'm going to tell you what, when you're too tired to drag yourself into the house of God, when you're too busy to be in the house of God, when you're too busy to hear what he's got to say, when you're, when you're so stressed. Do you see how many people stood up over the fear thing? Watch this. I don't care what anybody else tells you. Fear is faith. It is. It's faith that God's word is not going to work and that what the enemy said is going to happen is going is to prove true in your life. Okay? Fear of death, dying, fear of cancer, fear of being laid off, fear of lack, fear of not having enough, fear of your marriage is going to break up, fear of your kids going to die young, fear all that. Fear, that's faith, right? That's why you got to squash that stuff. So how in the world you come into church with your faith level here, but your fear level's here, and expect that you're going to hear anything from God? How, how, how's that happen? Why do you think the Bible says, fear not? Because <laughs> if I don't fear, then even if i got just a little bit of faith, I can hear God. Fear is a huge stopper to sensing the power, the presence, the anointing, and everything else that God brings into the situation. Fear is the, is the anecdote that stops that. But faith will crush fear. Watch this. How, how, do you, how does my faith get so big that it can crush the fear? I'm going I'm to tell you. This goes back to Thursday. You learn how to trust Jesus. And you cannot trust Jesus and simultaneously fear that Jesus is not going to come through. Fear says, Jesus ain't going to do this. Faith says, he already did. This fight's already fixed. So when we choose to trust Jesus, then we open ourselves up to who he is, which is love. And what does the Bible say about love? Perfect love casts out all. You want to hear from God? Fear not. Because if you don't fear not, you will hear not. Oh, then we got the blessing of computers. Ah! How many times have you been sold a computer? This is going to save you so much time. It's going to make you so much more effective. You're going to be so much more efficient. Do you know statistically they say now that for us to live our lives in this, in this society, we have to learn how to operate 20,000 apps and or pieces of machinery. 20,000? That computer is going to make you about as efficient as you understand how to make the computer work. See, we can get overloaded with good things. That's why I tell you that not every good thing is a God thing. In 1978, the average supermarket had 11,767 items in their store. Today, the average items in the store, 31,704. Man, you can't even go vitamin, you can't go buy vitamin D3 without sitting there for 10 minutes. Well, what's this brand? Well, what's this brand? Well, which one's got more IUs? Well, how much IUs is too much IUs? So you spend 10 minutes trying to decide on which bottle, because there's 50 bottles of vitamin D3. God help you when you get to vitamin C. Huh? You're going to be an hour on one aisle. They got you. Why? Lots of choices. Just watch when church is over. Where y'all want to go eat? It's because there's so many choices. If all there was was KFC, McDonald's, and Burger King, we would not be struggling. But there's a plethora. There's so many restaurants right now in Oklahoma City, we don't even know what half of them are or where they exist. It's a big deal when we narrow it down and say, well, let's do Mexican today, okay? We just narrowed it down to 500 restaurants. 
Then we're bombarded with all this information overload. Do you know that a single edition of the New York Times has more information than a British citizen of the 17th century knew in his entire life? That's how much information that we're consuming. And now it's not just on billboards and bumper stickers and, and, and yard signs. Now it's on QR codes and advertise, it's on the back of the labels of, of every piece of grocery that you buy. Then we have emails galore. We've got people vacating email addresses because, because the spam is, is so high. Then you got snail mail. Don't get me started on that. Oh, look, this is urgent. It's a yellow you know, red writing and underline exclamation circles. Open this now. And you think it might be the electric company saying, we're going to shut you off. So you rip that bad boy open and says, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to buy new storm windows. <laughs> so then you get upset and you rip it up because all that time and adrenaline you just wasted, you throw it in the trash to pick up another piece of mail. Then we have debt overload, national debt and personal debt. Listen, you need to vote in such a fashion. I, I am going to say it. You need to vote in such a fashion that you tell those in Washington that when you get your budget in line, that you can talk about mine. But do not have your budget out of line and then tell me i got to live within my means. It's amazing how good things have contributed to bad things in our society. We don't even know how to be creative anymore. Guys, when I was a kid, I played in the dirt. I had G.I. Joes. I had Star Wars. I had Hot Wheels. I, I had all kinds of stuff. I had sticks. Sticks were swords, guns, knives. They were, they were sabers. They were, I mean, sticks were everything. You understand what I'm saying? Bicycle. Oh, my goodness. Bicycles. I never had time to get a gut. I'm going to see how fast I can go. Then... Then they came out with a speedometer for your bicycle. Woo! -hoo. Now I'm really going to see how fast I can go. Man, I found so many hills and everything else I could to try to uh, get some tailwind. To, I, I wanted to get over 30 miles an hour so bad. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, pop wheelies, jump ramps, jump curbs. Did the ridiculous, played Frogger with the cars, and without any helmets. And we're still alive. You think you're going to get me with COVID? I ate dirt and survived. Oh. And then fear. Do you guys understand the more fear you intake, the more demonstration of stress in your life? I'm saying this so my wife can hear it. The more salt you take in, the higher the blood pressure. Some of y'all don't even know why that's funny. You cannot go to a restaurant with my wife and hide the salt. She will find you. <laughs> How many of you were the kid back when we actually went to each other's houses and played cards and ate popcorn and, and visited till the wee hours of the morning and the kids were told, now Johnny, go to bed. What do I want to be in bed for? The party's in here. You know I can hear you in my room. Huh? And so we would stay up, fight and sleep, because we were afraid we were going to miss something. Huh? Some of you, some of you parents used to, used to have little bets going on. How long do you think before he falls over? Ah, five minutes. I, I want to say five and a half. Let's just watch. Ah, one. Huh? You, 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 you trying to get the kids to go to sleep, but the kids don't want to go to sleep. Totally afraid you're going to miss something. Watch this. Take that now to an older kid. So now a kid is afraid whether or not he should take karate class. Why? Because maybe I'd be a more confident person if I took karate. So maybe I should. Maybe I'd feel better about myself. Possible. What, if, what am I missing if I say no to that class? Then let's move to the job. Start having fears because what if I don't go to the company party? 
Maybe I won't be able to pay my bills because I won't get that raise because I didn't go hobnob with people. Then you have fears about retirement. Then you have fears about health, health insurance. Fears can, can cause us to do things that we wouldn't ordinarily do. And then discontentment. <laughs> that drives us. I don't like my financial status. I'm going to work like a dog until I get it. Well, by the time you get it, you're going to be unhealthy as a dog and not be around to enjoy it. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's this constant cycle that the enemy's got us going in. Proverbs 15, 27 says, A greedy man brings trouble to his family. we got too many people with performance anxiety. Afraid they can't hold up, can't do enough, can't be enough. I'm going to say this. Trying to have more than God designed for you is bad for you. Let's go back to that 90% and 10%. 10% Levites. 10% of most churches are supposed to be in the fivefold. 90% is not. If you're in the 90% trying to be in the 10%, you're going to spend your life frustrating yourself because that's not your call. But you might be in the 10%, wishing to God you could be in the 90% to be like everybody else. So you spend your entire life running from the call so you can be in the 90 percentile. Both of them are going to die miserable because neither one of them accepted what God had created them to do. So be confident in who he made you to be. Yes, I'm going to say that too. If he made you a male, be confident that he made you a male. If he made you a female, be confident that he made you a female. If God created you as an entrepreneur in order to gain wealth, then do it. But if he didn't, quit trying to be like those that did. Enjoy what you got because enjoying what you have is a lot better than frustrations of what you don't have. Let's just be happy. I do not have to have an IROC Z or a 1969 fully restored Pontiac GTO in order to be happy. Unrealistic expectations set people up for failure. And I want you to understand you have to decide what you will not do with as much fervor as you, what you decide that you will do. I recently attended the funeral of a man that I knew many years ago. And in his eulogy, there were many mile markers that were discussed, degrees that he had acquired, personal accomplishments to his credit, and all these things were discussed. Were they good? Absolutely. But it occurred to me as I thought about this ceremony, among other things that I'm not going to go into right now, it caused me to ponder degrees of material wealth. Job was a great indication of what happens to many wealthy people. They live in fear that somebody else is going to get it from them. So they can't even enjoy it. But it occurred to me that when we stand before God, we're going to be weighed on whether or not we accomplish what God intended for us to accomplish. Not whether we had more than our neighbor. The main thing has to be that I altered Frank's life and pointed him just a little bit more to Jesus than he would have been if he hadn't bumped into me. That, that's my goal. That's my goal with everybody that I come in contact with. I, I want to I just fractionally just change the position just a little bit and point them a little bit more to Jesus so that when I get to heaven... What maybe I started in somebody's life, somebody else came along and, and another divine appointment came along and each person watched, did a little bit until they were right in the path of having a, an epiphany with God. That's what we're called to do. It's not so I can put my tax return up against your tax return and say how much better I am than you are because look how much I... You see what I'm saying? None of that matters. It doesn't matter if you got in here with a car that had AC or doesn't have AC, has windows, doesn't have windows. None of that matters. 
has a tire that's out of balance or inbound. What difference does it make? Did it get you here? You got the same result that, that everybody else did. Do you, you see where I'm at? When we come together as a family and as a body, we need to celebrate and cherish who they are, where they're at. Got so many people coming to God as less than because they don't understand who he made them to be. I built you, kid. You're mine. Put your head up. Walk into my presence. I created you for this. And we've listened so much to the nonsense and all the stress and anxiety that's pushed us down that we walk into the presence of God like this and wonder why we walk out with nothing. So how do we deal with this in our lives? Romans 12 gives us the prescription. Verse 1, so I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God. This is your rational, logical, and intelligent act of worship. Look at verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. His, his purpose and plan for me is not going to be his, his purpose and plan for you. We're all going the same direction, but we're taking different paths. So we need to open our eyes to the realities that exist today in our society, like we talked about in the pre-glow with what's going on with the Olympics. We, we're not to be blind, deaf, and dumb. We need to pay attention and understand that if they're that flagrant against the things, see, that wasn't even against the church. That wasn't against the church. That was against God. And the church who's supposed to represent God by and large, is not even offended. What do you think happened on the day when Goliath was standing out there blaspheming God? David got upset and said, what is the rest of the church not doing? Sit there. I'll do it. God is looking for a church full of Davids, a David anointing, a David fervor, a David fire, a David fight that's not intimidated by the size of the enemy, but rather is so elated and impressed and relaxed in the size of who God is.